My dear friends, good day. Cast not a clout till May is out. Well, you can forget about this saying right away because today we're going to do the opposite and we're going to talk about those who get naked to frolic in the wild. I call them naturists. Because naturism is not only about old people who enjoy themselves naked on the water's edge, it's also a philosophical movement and a way of life with a rich and complex history that allows to touch, it's the case to say it, a lot of fascinating subjects. You may not know it, but before being a leisure and tourism practice, naturism has its roots in the medical world. The term naturist appears for the first time in the book Recherche sur l'histoire de la médecine, written in 1768 by the doctor Théophile de Bordeaux. By this term, he means in fact the vitalist doctors. And here, it deserves some explanation. In the 18th century, medical circles were divided by a controversy. On the one hand, we have the mechanistic doctors, who were largely in the majority, and on the other hand, the vitalist doctors, the newcomers. The mechanists were influenced by Descartes' ideas and tried to have a rational vision of the human body. Basically, for them, the body is governed by chemical and physical processes, all scientific and without magical or spiritual intervention. From there, to improve medicine, we need to do anatomical experiments, especially on cadavers, to find out which stimuli cause which reactions, and then deduce how we can use this knowledge to treat the living. So when you put it that way, it sounds pretty normal to us today. But you have to be aware that at the time, this was a thought that was in radical contrast to the medicine of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the famous theory of humors. This Cartesian vision of medicine and the human body was opposed by vitalist physicians such as the Englishman Nehemiah Gru, the German Georg Ernst Stahl, and, in France, among others, Théophile de Bordeaux. For them, the human body cannot be reduced to chemical and material processes. An immaterial spiritual force also comes into play, which would animate the whole living organism. This is what we call vital energy. This vital energy, according to them, would connect us very strongly to nature and would be fundamentally good. Therefore, for vitalists, it's important to observe nature and let it do its work in order to treat the sick as well as possible. For nature would have everything it needs to rebalance itself and heal the sick. Moreover, for some of these doctors, the disease is not even bad. It is just the symptom that the vital energy would be at work to rebalance the body. It would therefore not necessarily be necessary to fight against this disease. It's a bit reminiscent of those who now think that you can prevent an epidemic by drinking carrot juice, but that doesn't work. In the face of the progress of conventional medicine in the first part of the 19th century, the ideas of the vitalists gradually receded, but without disappearing completely. In fact, it is more of a transformation that we are witnessing, and throughout the 19th century, we will see fans for alternative, paramedical care techniques, all coming from Germanic lands before spreading elsewhere in Europe. Among these techniques, we find hydrotherapy, healing with water, heliotherapy, healing with the sun, or aerotherapy, the fresh air cures of the countryside. Each time, in all these techniques, the idea is the same. Humans have everything they need to heal themselves through themselves. If they get sick, it's because modern society weakens their body and their health. It brings a form of degeneration, and therefore it is necessary to regenerate the patients by putting them in contact with nature. And here, we are talking about physiotherapy, i.e. natural medicine, and it's in these environments that naturism will be born. Well, okay, but how do you go from the fresh air in the mountains prescribed by your doctor to doing sports naked? Well, the idea of nudity will gradually appear under the pen of intellectuals from the end of the 19th century in France and Germany. But the one who really gives it momentum and finds success with the public is the German Heinrich Pudol. He published two books on the subject of nudity, Nude Men in 1893 and The Culture of Nudity in 1906. And in his books, he really advocates the practice of nudism. According to his thinking, modern doctors are degenerate, prey to many vices and health problems. The logical conclusion comes again that this is the need for regeneration. The key to practicing this regeneration is, according to him, always in the practice of nudity in nature, chastity in sports, and following a vegetarian and ascetic diet. That is to say, poor in pleasures. Basically, an austere diet. Clearly, it's not with him that will make a good raclette. But Heinrich Budo's thinking goes a bit further than that. He is a follower of nationalist ideas and eugenics. For him, naturism is a way to strengthen the German nation. This idea makes its little way in the Germanic lands, and a true movement entitled Nudo Nacio appears from the year 1905. 
In 1907, for example, the Nudo Nacio Aristocratic Alliance was created, which proposed to federate various local associations organized in the form of lodges. The selection of candidates and their initiation by progressive degrees are carried out in an openly racist and eugenic perspective. The aim is to select future breeding stock in order to put the Germanic race on the road to regeneration. A great atmosphere, huh? In any case, you will have understood that the majority of this milieu welcomes with open arms the arrival in power of a chancellor with a small mustache called Adolf Hitler. But still, it would be a mistake to believe that the politicization of this milieu only takes place in one direction. In Germany, we can still mention the Jugendbewegung, a powerful scouting organization created in 1896 and which advocates freedom, fraternity, and adventure through a return to nature. This organization took up the issue of nudity at the beginning of the 20th century and argued that it was a healthy and natural practice, particularly via bathing in rivers. According to these young people, modesty in this context is a bourgeois prudery that poorly hides a sexual obsession. This Jugendbewegung is globally subscribed to a humanist, emancipating, and left-wing culture. In France, also in the same period, one sees a politicization of naturism, and it is thus that a part of the anarchist circle invests in the naturist movement which is born. One can, for example, read in 1907 in the review La Marche, a series of eight articles entitled Hygiene and Anarchism. In these articles, the author wishes, I quote, that man gets closer to nature, that is to say, to the truth, since he is a fruit of this nature governed by its laws, and he will find that in him the vital force is able to defend him against the onslaught of disease. In the same way, later, one finds socialist and libertarian naturists gathered within the Naturist Union founded in 1934. For them, naturism is a vector of equality, emancipation, and peace between people. Stranger, some try to elaborate a purely naturist political program. This is the case for Kiené de Monjou, the founder of the Sparta Club, one of the most important naturist clubs in France in the 1930s. He is going to advocate what one calls an integral naturism, which consists of a mixture of libertarian, eugenicist, hygienist ideas, of practice of sport, of nudity, but also of sexual education. Basically, he sees in this integral naturism a tool of social transformation, and once again, of peace between peoples. Kiené de Monjou, he will even run for the legislative elections in 1932 in Paris, under the label of the Social Party of Public Health. But without success, he'll get a ridiculous score. So, so far we've seen how naturism has gone from a medical practice to a relatively militant practice of sports nudity. But how do we go from these circles of conviction to a practice of tourism and mass leisure? Well, in France, the Durville brothers are not for nothing. The Durville brothers, André and Gaston by name, are doctors by training. They have passed their theses, they have their diploma, in short, they are real doctors. However, from the start, they have been moving away from conventional medicine towards naturist paramedicine. They describe themselves as psychonaturist doctors, and around 1920, they opened their Institute of Natural Medicine in Paris. They later renamed it the Naturist Institute, then the Free School of Naturism. At the school, in this institute, the Durville brothers proposed to cure their patients thanks to baths of light or water, but also thanks to hypnosis and to techniques close to magnetism. Nothing very abnormal considering what we have seen so far in this video, but it is the way they evolve afterwards that is quite interesting, since they will create, in a few years, two naturist centers on two different islands, which will play a very important role in the popularization of the practice in France. First, on the island of Platé, on the Seine in Yvelines, not far from Paris, in 1929, they found a first naturist center, answering to the name of Physiopolis, that is to say, the city of nature. They build their sport facilities, in particular a swimming pool, a tennis court, a basketball court, but also many tents in fibro cement to welcome the boaters, mainly Parisians who come to spend the weekend to get away from it all and do some sports. Then, in 1931, they bought land on the island of Levant, off the coast of Hier in the Mediterranean. There they build Heliopolis, that is, City of the Sun, again with the aim of bringing naturist vacationers. And while on the first island, Physiopolis, total nudity is forbidden, you have to wear a bathing suit, on the second one, it is progressively authorized. After the Second World War, Heliopolis will become one of the major European centers of naturism. For example, in the summer of 1952, no less than 30,000 tourists passed through this small island. And it's necessary to say that beyond the case of Heliopolis, post-World War II France is quite simply the paradise of European naturism. 
At this time, Spain, I remind you, is under the dictatorship of Franco. Italy is still too Catholic to make place for naturism, and Yugoslavia is on the other side of the Iron Curtain. This leaves only the south of France to offer a warm climate to meet the demand of naturist tourists from northern European countries. This success is such that according to the American historian Stephen Harp of the University of Akron, naturism by the tourist flows which it brings plays an important role in the economic revival of the coastal regions of the south of France after the Second World War. In the same period immediately after the war, there is another duo which is very important for the history of naturism. That is the couple Albert and Christian Lecoq. This couple creates a naturist campsite in Montélivet in the department of the Gironde in 1950. And the same year, they also found the French Federation of Naturism. It is this association which federates progressively all the naturist groups which until then were separated. The FFN, as it is called, will not cease growing to become the major actor of naturism in France. To illustrate this growth, in 1953, the Federation counts 1,630 members at the date of their contribution, whereas in 1978, they are 75,000. This Federation, since the beginning, defends the idea of a practice of naturism wanting to be pacifist, familial, and international. According to them, nudity is a factor of equality between the classes, between the ages, between the bodies, a factor of acceptance of self and emancipation. It is really with this federation that naturism takes its current form. At this stage of the episode, you're going to tell me, okay, well, but why don't you tell us about sex? Because it's so cute, all this stuff, but we know that these people, they do a little crack crack in the dunes. Well, not at all. According to Stephen Harp, it is really from the creation of the naturist village of Cap d'Ag in 1974 in the department of Ero that new practices develop with the appearance of a real sexual tourism. And the least we can say is that it is not at all well regarded by the traditional naturists. It must be said that the original pioneers of the movement were almost all in favor of a chaste and family practice of nudity. In the same way, the French Federation of Naturism sets up strict rules from the beginning to avoid any sexual behavior. Clearly, these new behaviors are a source of many tensions in the naturist environment. Divisions which still last today between the libertine nudists on one side and the classic naturists on the other. The second ones, especially not wanting to be associated with the first ones, it is thus very important to make the distinction between the two. As we have seen, the history of naturism has been made through a back and forth between France and Germany. Naturism knew multiple evolutions, passing from a medical practice to a militant practice, including on a political ground, to become, finally, the tourist and leisure practice we know today. Moreover, nowadays, it seems that the golden age of naturism is over, since the French Federation of Naturism has fewer members than in the 1970s, and we are witnessing a problem of generation renewal. But this is another page of the history of naturism. A YouTuber would have to militate by shouting, all naked, in each video. But it won't be me, because I'm in other niches. Thanks to Damien Trontenier for the preparation of this video. He has a channel specialized in the popularization of history and the sciences of religions. I put a link for you in the description. And don't hesitate to share, to like, to comment, to subscribe. See you soon on Nota Bene.